Hello everyone and welcome to episode 6 of the Film Score Podcast. Today I'm talking with composer Ben Simons. Prior to becoming a film composer, Ben was the lead guitarist and songwriter for the popular UK metal band Malefis. And after a decade with Malefis, Ben started scoring numerous short films before jumping into multiple features, including his most recent, the UK gory horror film, Hosts. Now, Hosts is a combination of a supernatural home invasion movie with an underlying family drama. To reinforce its gory tension, Ben delivers a dread-filled and unnerving score. I've been getting some comments and reviews lately that have all been really positive, so I really appreciate those. If you want to leave some more, feel free to go ahead. And remember, you can always reach me on Twitter or Instagram at TheFilmScorer, or visit my website, which is TheFilmScorer.com. love hearing from people, so feel free to reach out to me. We're about halfway through the season, so there are still... Many great interviews on the way before I'll take a little break and deliver a whole bunch more. Let's get to what you're really here for, the interview. So I hope you enjoy. Ben, I really appreciate you joining me today. How have you been? It's my absolute pleasure, first of all, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm very well, yeah. We've just um, just come back from a, a lovely walk, uh, autumnal walk in the Cotswolds, and uh, yeah, having a nice day. Thank you very much. Well, see, I guess you couldn't ask for much better. I mean, every everywhere else is going crazy, going in lockdown, and you're in this picturesque wonderland. Yeah, I mean, it's still lockdown, but at least we have lots of natural beauty on our doorstep. It's fine to do nothing when you choose to do nothing, but when you're told you can do nothing, you're like, well, I want to do things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the problem, right? Speaking of doing things, I see that you've been very busy composing. So recently... Your feature film, Hosts, just came out, and mm-hmm. I know you have maybe another three, four, five, six things coming out on the horizon. Yeah. So let's jump into a few of those. So first with Hosts, how did that come about? Okay, well, that's interesting because I've actually been really good friends with one of the directors, Richard Oakes, for um, a long time, going back to when I wasn't composing and I was just in a band. He used to make, and still does make, very very good music videos for bands and he but he'd always wanted to do film and we've been friends and he decided to make his first short film this is back in like 2015 ish so he wrote a film called exit plan like a 20 minute little sci-fi movie and he needed a composer and i was literally the only one he knew that did cinematic music so asked me to do it i was like yeah yeah sure man like no worries that's on youtube by the way if you don't want to check it out just look up exit plan and then um I'll be the person he works with until the end, basically. We're, we've been very, very good friends for a long time. And, you know, sometimes you meet someone along the path of your journey in a creative world, and you meet someone that you know is going to go on to do some really good stuff. And that's the person or people you meet along the way that you need to latch on to and make sure that you continually do your best work with. Because if they're going to go up, they're going to take you with them. And that's that, that's what you need. But I've always always tried to repay the favor because he was, I actually got him his first in as a DOP. So started getting him in touch with a lot more directors and working with other people. So we, we've had that relationship for a while where I'll try and get him work and he'll always try and get me work with people he's working with. And it's always been a, a nice friendly little leg up for each other whenever we can. Nice. So how's the relationship between the two of you work? I mean, when you're composing and his kind of comments come back. He's a unique person to work with because he actually studied music production uh, at university so he knows what he's talking about but he just he just can't do it like he can't write the music or do you know film score stuff but he knows what he wants but can't always talk about it in a way that he can actually portray what he's looking for which is understandable is that's our job is to decode the things that people say and work out what they actually mean we've evolved over the time so he's very um precious obviously as you would be about like he knows what he wants and he wants to make sure that 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 happens so to start with he found it a bit more difficult to just sort of let me go and do what i my instinctive thing to do is but then after a while of working together he's got a lot used to and actually now wants to step back and just be like i want you to just do like whatever you think is right um and then we can talk about it afterwards so that's very freeing but i'll always 
normally at the start of a project, like before they've started filming, which is what I did with hosts, I write a few demos anyway, because I want to try and tap into what the sound of whatever I'm going to be working on is. So first, they, so they can be excited about the fact that that's been achieved and they have, don't have to worry about like the music so much anymore. Because once you've found the sort of what the musical landscape of a film is going to be, that's almost like the hardest part, I think. Like once you've established those key elements, then you can write the music with that. But he also likes to be really hands-on. So we had to shoot the film in two parts because um, we needed the right weather to shoot outside because it's set around Christmas time. So for the last sort of half an hour of the film, I actually moved my studio into his house and, and he sort of sat with me he would be working on something in the background, editing or visual effects, that kind of stuff. And I'd be writing and he'd just be listening. And, and would when I'd get to the end of a thing I was trying to get out of my brain, he would tell me what he thought. But it's always been really, really easy with him because he knows what he's looking for. And I understand it. And it, it just it just happens really naturally. Interesting. And I mean, so first, that actually just sounds like a really good relationship. I think sometimes it can be a little too hands off and... The, the end product ends up being something that the director's not quite looking for, and other times it too hands-on. So that seems like a nice balance, and obviously having yeah. seen hosts, you know, it, it turned out well. Thank you. One thing I did want to ask as well, before we kind of get more into the specifics of the film, and mm -hmm. first hosts is, to put it very simply, it's a horror, supernatural-ish home invasion movie, I guess you could call it. Yeah. I think that's that's boiling it down a little too yeah. much. I think you could add the word drama in there. I think it's um yeah. yeah, there's definitely a family drama element. Yeah, like it's not it's not a cheap thrills horror movie by any stretch of the imagination. It's not um it's not designed to elicit the jump scare, you know, it's that's not the end goal. Right. Um so it's it's got some other layers going on which I think makes it interesting as well. No, absolutely. And, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned that as well. One thing that you mentioned to me before I had watched it, with the score, you wanted to do some things that you hadn't heard in horror before, mm. which I think it, it begs two questions. At least two questions came to mind for me. What are some of the things that you find common in horror music that you wanted to get away from? And then what was your thought process in doing things that you haven't heard. Yeah, I think, and it, it goes with, I think, a lot of different kinds of genres of films. I think you can look at a genre and be like, well, my next job is to write a plucky, um, funny comedy movie. Then I'm just going to write like pizzicato and silly little musical motifs that will be, and that's like, and I'll be like, right, well, I'll do that because that's what you do when you write comedy. Or you look at horror and you think, well... There'll be some really horrific sounding strings and lots of weird stuff and textures that have been created using strings. And there'll be big string impacts for jump scares. And I mean, I don't want to shit on what the work that people do in horror because obviously there's a lot of really good stuff. But we watched like 40 movies in, in horror over Halloween period. And I just sometimes I find it a little uninspiring. Like I find I don't ever get caught out by the music as like a, an emotional tool. I find it's it's more often used as a tool to add fear and to create fear, but not to do the some of the other emotional points in films within horror. And I wanted to move away from that and try and make everything in the score for hosts emotionally driven and not driven by trying to scare people. I guess one way you can look at it is is the layers that it, it works on a functional basis. Mm. And I think quite often you get music that it's, it's okay, this is an action sequence, so this needs to just be pounding and relentless to build the action. Mm -hmm. And it does that on the surface level in the very kind of obvious ways. And I'm, I'm stealing from a composer interview I listened to a couple of days ago, and I can't remember the composer, it was on a panel, but he was saying where in a, in a chase sequence, that's normally what you hear. But then you have to take into account, like, there are characters in the chase. And so maybe you want to also include their internal responses or what's going on in their heads or what's led them to these yeah. points. And that's where you get these more kind of dynamic or deeper yeah. scores that aren't just, here's what's what's going on and on the literal surface level and we're going to replicate. So that, that person sounds like he thinks in the same way that I do. I'm not thinking about necessarily always just what you're seeing i'm trying to write from the perspective of the person or characters that are involved in the situation it might have been 
Harry Manfredini or one other like classic horror composer. So, I mean, that's it's good company to be in. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I mean, I feel, I feel bad. Like, I don't think that horror scores are bad. I think they add a lot to horror. Like, my mum would always say, you know, when she watches Alien, I can watch it if I turned the sound off because the music freaks her out so much that it's that's what's making her so scared, which is amazing because that's the job. Like, the music is super helpful in doing that. It's, it would be the same with any genre. I would, I don't want to do what people do or have done already. So I didn't listen to any horror scores. We didn't use any horror scores as reference material. We'd had no temp music or anything like that. And I know the next time I get a film, and I, whatever genre or whatever topic is, I'm not going to research any films like it. I'm just going to do what feels right to me. You know, that's that's what I want to do. I don't want to fit a mold. Did you listen to anything specifically for the film or was it just you just went in raw most to do yeah just straight raw like just that sounds terrible um <laughs> <laughs> like we always have a lot of conversations in advance because we hang out all the time we're, we're always in the pub um i used to live down the road from him so we'd always be talking about what he's going to be working on or what's going to be coming up way in advance of of, of actually it happening I start building these pictures of what I want to try and do based on the descriptions of what the characters are like and how they come to be and the dynamic between the family. And then then I just, I need to just get that out somehow. So then I just start exploring the musical landscape and hope that when I send them the first few demos over that that's kind of what they thought too. So one of the things that surprised me with the score, or, or maybe I'd say it caught me off guard a little bit, especially when I was listening to it before watching the film, because at that point, I didn't know what the film was about, and I didn't know the setting. I didn't know it was set at Christmas. So there's... That makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's it's around halfway through, maybe a third of the way through the, the film and the score. You kind of do a rendition of the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. And I, you know, I'm not going to give away any plot points, but it, it comes sort of after a horrific sequence so there's there's a there's a good juxtaposition between what happened on screen and i guess the the feelings that that song normally elicits yeah <laughs> but it's also the renditions also in this just really almost like out of tune bizarre way it, it reminded me of i don't know if you've ever heard of the music project the caretaker i've not no I recommend looking it up. It's it's just this brilliant project, and the main project that he had done, it's, I don't know, maybe it's like 150 tracks that are meant to basically track someone falling into the depths of dementia. But it, it has that similarity where you have music that sounds familiar, and it just sort of like slowly gets degraded. It drew some similarities in kind of the broader sense of it, and I thought it was just so interesting because it takes what you're used to and really makes it awful in yeah. obviously a good I know. way i know honestly like I, I actually wrote that and came up with the idea for it before i'd seen it i did like four or five demos and that was one of the demos because i always had this idea because we we spoke about the fact that they would um they're meant to be like you know relatively well-off family and i had this idea that they would have like um like a record player in their house and that they listen to like classical music and like around christmas time they have this record and like when they're in the house like when they're cooking and stuff you can hear other renditions that i've done that are way less messed up they're just kind of normal sounding but it still has the same tone so i ran it all through um like a vinyl replication plugin that had so i could add things like warping so it would like bend in and out of tune i could add like um artifacts like dust and the needle quality and all that kind of stuff to make it sound really not normal but i just ramped it up when i came to um that particular track and then obviously it does maintain as the original track all the way through but i add a lot of elements on top to to make you feel like it's it could very easily be something completely different i only did it because i thought it would be funny like i just found the idea hilarious like you've just seen probably one of the most horrendous deaths in a film you'll see for a long time and i thought it's christmas how hor horrendously disgusting would it be if we used such a nice piece of music and just after that and just make it the most horrendous and uncomfortable listening experience possible it worked i part of these a little upset that i'd listened to the score so i knew that it was going to come at some point and you'd, you'd told me it followed something horrendous but i can imagine watching it and having it come in just how much of a punch that would be yeah after the moment happens that that whole piece of music that plays out everything that's going on during that is still 
really not very nice. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're you're <laughs> sitting in, you're basically sitting in the fallout of what's happened with the family, and yeah, that's that's playing over top, and and I think that's a good way to put it. It's almost in a, a mocking manner as well. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting, and and you mentioned too how beforehand you do hear renditions of that song yeah and i thought that was that was interesting it it sets the tone well to me it almost felt like a because it's it's pushed down a lot farther in the mix than most of the other music so it felt almost like a a holiday music yeah like they've just got some like dodgy vinyl from a market somewhere of some guy playing piano versions of christmas tracks and they've just got it on in the house somewhere and you, you notice it but you don't listen to it but you know it's playing so that when it happens in in the film, when you hear this that particular piece of music, you feel like, oh, well, that would happen because we've heard some stuff before anyway. But we didn't have the time to like, or the budget or anything like that to build in this idea of that they're actually being a record player there and get shots of it and stuff. Because we shot the film in like 11 days. Wow. 11 days for like a 20,000 pound budget. So we made it for nothing. You know, the crew was like 20 of us. I was on set every day. So I also did uh, script supervision and like helping out on set. I was there every day and then we'd go home and like write little ideas for things I've seen. And yeah, it was super all hands on deck. I know that you've done a lot of shorts and I think that was the third feature that you'd done. Correct. Did you notice a benefit or any sort of difference in being on set all the time? I've, I've spoken to him a lot about it. That's the first film I've worked on set. I will be gunning to work on set in some capacity with every film I ever do moving forwards. Well, first of all, you get to actually be a part of the experience and hang out with all the cast and crew and actually feel like part of the the team, which I always felt like I'd missed because I'm always, you know, the musicians are the last people to really get involved. And I just felt like I wasn't really feeling like I was part of the team and I wanted to be more involved with the process. And I think seeing things unravel and being on set and really getting to know the script inside out seeing it all come to life and seeing the shots definitely adds some kind of level of knowledge and and like even if it's just subtle like it's just like a oh i'm i think i'm doing the right thing because you're kind of seeing it so like you know that your ideas are probably going on the right path that's sort of matching what the visuals that you've been imagining are so i do think subconsciously if anything it it certainly helps and it adds a lot of um like confidence and help it just helps to inspire as well like when you're seeing these shots take place and dialogue scenes happening like oh i think i've got an idea for what i could do with these scenes when i actually get it and you might i take a little note or something like what i might want to do or a feeling i have and and then hopefully it translates when you actually get the edit i find that really fascinating because top to bottom every composer i've talked to basically is never on set so i think that's really cool to hear how beneficial it is true and i just think like i could be like just a composer or I could just write music, you know, one way or another. It wouldn't doesn't necessarily need to be film. But, like, I've chosen it that my, my the goal and what I love to do is to write music for film. So the more involved in film that I can be, because I love film, the better. Because I want to learn. I'm fascinated about how films get made. I love hanging out in different departments and learning about how they capture on-set sound. And I helped out with some boom-op stuff from the second shoot that we did. Helping out in, like special effects stuff with like onset blood and I love all that stuff like I want to I want to learn everything like how are they doing all this stuff and I just want to absorb as much information as possible and it's just it's just cool you know it's like all these guys are working on a film for like a year and then I come along like plonk some notes and I write some music and that's that but I, I like to be involved during that whole year that they're working on it providing I'm not working on anything else so I can um hopefully continue to manage to build time where I can be on set because I don't want to just hang out I want to work you know, I want to be on set working, doing a specific function that also adds value to the project alongside the value that that will later add when I come to write music. I think it it would give you kind of a more immersed experience with the film. You're not you're not getting it at the end of the day. You've been with it almost from day one mm. and are working so intimately with it, particularly when you're doing script supervision, too. You're in the actual literal letters of the film. Yeah. So... I get that. And look, at the same time, I understand why I think a lot of film composers don't want to do that. They do music and that's what they're happy with and comfortable with. I get that as well. You know, I think it's, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? People are very happy in their studios writing music and they want to do that. And that's their primary focus. And and it is for me as well. That's where I inevitably want to end up being. But I just really enjoy the, the other side of the process too. And I just find it also fascinating, you know. I've uh, very briefly dabbled in other as- like in aspects of the the filmmaking process a, 
what feels like another life ago. <laughs> and yeah, I've, I've always found it fascinating. So I totally get where you're coming from, you know, whether it's like writing a script, being an extra, doing whatever. I just think it's, it's such a cool, utterly complicated process that True. most people who are sitting in front of the TV screen or the theater screen don't necessarily realize. Yeah. And also, if you are a young and up and coming composer listening to this, and you're wondering how to meet more people to find new connections who will inevitably end up recommending you to hopefully get more work, then being on set, meeting all the crews that will ultimately go on to work on other projects with other directors, if they're on your team, and they're going on new sets and saying to the director, oh, I've just worked with this guy, he did a really good job on the film, um, I met him on set then, you know, you're going to start building up your network of people, which is another one of the reasons that I like to get on set because I'm proactively trying to get more work. I'm not some guy who's living a life of luxury, getting paid megabucks to, you know, to write music for films. I still have to hustle and think about ways to market and get myself more exposure. And it's lucky that I love being on set, but it's definitely adds a lot of value in terms of creating new opportunities down the line as well. I think that's great advice. And not just that, too. You never know who in a, I don't want to call it like a secondary position, but someone who's not the director, what they'll end up doing. You know, there there are so many instances where someone does, maybe they're a second unit director, they do makeup, they do whatever else in the, the production side, mm -hmm. and then they go and end up in a different position. They end up directing. I should have a more recent example on, <laughs> on hand, but I know like the, the guy that directed Halloween 3 was originally, I think, the makeup artist in Halloween 1 and 2. That's crazy, right? Just, you, you never know who's going to do what. Yeah. If you're up for it and you want to make a go of it, then nothing is a bad idea, right? Yeah. Why not? One of the other things that I found really interesting in Hosts is it largely has the same sonic palette throughout Barring a couple of those total changes, like the, the Sugar Plum Fairy, the end credits track as well is quite different. But there were a few sounds within that that I found really interesting. And mm -hmm. one of them is in the garden sequence near the beginning. There's this kind of light, almost raspy sounding drum effect. It's one thing getting the general palette, but I mean, how do you decide which actual sounds or instruments to use? Yeah. Well, I think experimentation, I think my normal starting point is I don't have a pre-built template, for example. So every new project, I'll build a template from scratch and we'll just add everything I think could be useful at some point. And then we'll add or remove things as I'm going along. If I'm not using something, I'll get rid of it. But if I need something or something pops up, I'm like, that could be cool. Then I'll add it. I think that's a really important starting point for me is not opening up mega template one and starting from there because I know I'm going to do the same things again. So I always try and find the sources of inspiration for the project from scratch. Well, for one, you know, I'm, I'm limited, right? I don't have a thousand synths in the background. And in a position where as much as I don't love it right now, I'm in the box, you know, everything's in the computer. It's all sample libraries. But that doesn't mean that I have to use them as intended. So I might find a cool sound and then process it and manipulate it into it sounding not how it should. And that sounds really interesting. And even if it's just a subtle texture, it's something that is ultimately adding. But at the end of the day, it's always that fine balance between I never want there to be too much. So I always need to rein in where the line is. When do you know a thing you're writing is done? I'm always quite strict on myself and always try not to overwrite and not to overcomplicate. I always see my job as being serving what you see and what people are feeling, not my own musical interest. So I'm not trying to show off or do anything that makes me look cool or clever. I just want it to be what feels necessary. So that's just one of those sounds that I found in a little obscure percussion library that I had and just messed it up a bit, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that approach does make sense. And I've, I've said this to some people in the past, but your role as the composer, obviously, is first and foremost making something that's going to work in the film and enhance the film. If it does make you look clever, if it does end up being an, an, an iconic sound or theme or something, like that's great, but how it works in context is the most important. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that sentiment. Yeah. Well, I, I wish I could take credit for it, but <laughs> I can't. 
I am curious then, because you aren't listening to music while you're scoring something, or at least you're not listening to music for the purpose of getting inspiration for it. Yeah. What inspired you in the first place to get into film music? I mean, my dad listened to quite a lot of classical music when I was growing up. So I always really enjoyed classical music. And then I went away from that and started a metal band and was all about heavy music. And and it wasn't until I was maybe like 19, 20 that I sort of that discovered that film music even really existed, I guess. Like I wasn't listening to it when I was young. And I don't know why, but I think it might, it might have been Gladiator. I, I, I watched Gladiator when I was really young. And just I think I felt very moved by it and established that it was probably because of the music at certain points and then listened to the score. And that was, I probably think was the first score I ever really like listened to instead of hearing in passing whilst it's happening. Like Jaws, for example, obviously scared me when I was really young. I broke my leg when I was like five and the hospital I was in, like had it on a TV up in front of my bed and like, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't turn it off. I was just like there, like looking at it. Yeah. It messed me up. But so that obviously contributed a lot, but had never listened to a score until I think Gladiator. And then I was like, oh, wait, so you're telling me I could write kind of classical music, but it's like for films and it's not, I haven't got like any rules really I need to follow. I can, it can be kind of cool. It can be like rock and it can have riffs and I can do all sorts of stuff in, in film music. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get logic. And, and then it had all these terrible MIDI samples in there. So I was just started dabbling and it all elevated from there. Interesting. It's so funny how just those little moments can be so inspiring. I do love the idea of the the image that I have in my head of you like strapped in a bed as a five year old being traumatized. It just reminds <laughs> me of like, Malcolm McDowell and A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, I have nightmares about it still. <laughs> it's always re- it's the same reoccurring dream, and it's always that I'm on the edge of a swimming pool, and the swimming pool has sharks in for some reason. But the and then I'm being forced into the pool by a big digger. Just driving towards me, and I can't move. I can't do anything but go in the water. Real insight into my subconscious there for you guys. Thank you. I'm just going to transition this into a you know a therapy, <laughs> a therapy now. Yeah. <laughs> why, why not? With Gladiator, Hans Zimmer then is a a composer that at least has had some impact on you. Are there any other, whether it be classical composers or more contemporary film or otherwise composers that have impacted you? I certainly have Hans Zimmer to thank for that sort of big introduction to film music because he went on and did some films that were when I was growing up I can't think of a fancy word but they were important like when I saw Inception for example I was like oh geez that's doing something that I didn't that I've not heard film music do before which was obviously super cool my dad gave me CD copies of Handel's Messiah um, Mozart's Requiem and for Valley's Four Seasons so those three have always been really important to me but then more recently i've always loved and it's a quite an obscure one i think um do you know have you seen the film seven pounds with will smith yeah it's the most depressing film ever but angelo mealy the score he wrote for that is just the most beautiful thing and despite my my history of, of writing music being normally quite dread filled i absolutely love writing and listening to somber emotional music because i just find it like the the ability for someone to write music that invokes such a pure reaction of sadness i think is just the most pure thing that you can do to somebody else musically and i've always been fascinated with it so i I love writing um, music for drama and like really heightened emotional music i've always really enjoyed so i've got a lot to thank for angela mealy as well i think he's amazing interesting i don't think i've ever actually listened like listened to the score so i'll probably i'll do that soon I mean, that is one of the things that I find so fascinating with, with music generally, but also when you really dissect film sometimes with film music as well, is how it can really hit those emotions. And, and like you said about Alien earlier, where without it, it may have some sort of impact, but when you add the music in, it just amplifies things mm-hmm. tenfold. And the ability to do that is... I think to a to a listener sometimes or a viewer, it, it almost feels like magic. Like you're you're hitting the the right tone and note combination that makes someone cry or puts someone yeah. into fear or anger or it gets their heart pounding. Yeah, totally. And I always think like you know it's good when you couldn't imagine there being anything else there in its replacement. And it doesn't necessarily mean to be, need to be like the theme. It can just 
just the sound of the film, like Gravity, for example, by Stephen Price, right? That score's insane. And it couldn't be anything else, in my opinion. Like, the way that he approached it and what he did, that is the sound that is Gravity to me. I don't think anyone else could have done it. So it has to be him. That's what I love, is like, when it's done right, it's the only thing that could ever be on that film. So if you replaced it with something else, it just couldn't work. I love that. Do you ever try rescoring pieces? No, I've not done that. I've done things like that in the past where I've loved something so much that I've tried to do my own version of it. One of the first things I ever, it's not going to say released, because I don't think when you're writing music for the first time you release music, it's just music is available or not. But I, I did like my own score version of the seven pounds trailer so like i rescored the trailer but in the style of angelo mealy and i've I've always found that as like an interesting learning experience is i wouldn't i don't know if you call it imitation but recreation like how do they make that sound like how did they write that phrase and working out like how it all goes together because i'm not musically trained i'm i'm solely use my ears so i find it really fascinating to like listen so like when i recreated the star wars trailer for example and i did it on on my twitch channel I just listen like intently and I can like separate the layers and hear like, oh, there's a brass line doing this here. And then I can play it in. And I, I just love piecing it all together and, and seeing like, oh, right. So that's how they do that. It's just, uh, I find it all fascinating, man. It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> See, me, you know, meanwhile, for me, I very briefly was able to read music a decade ago and that's it. So whether, whether you do it by ear or can read it, it's all magic for me. Oh, you're, you're 100% right. I, I think people who are trained and musically educated of wizards man i don't understand like i actually on my first feature i had an assistant this was invasion planet earth the guy wanted like a proper score man like a proper like throwback 70s style thematic score and i was like oh boy i don't know if i can do that but i'm gonna say yes anyway um (laughs) so i got myself an assistant um that i met who was studying at birmingham conservatoire his name's Peter, he's a legend. And I was like, I need you, bud, because I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to write all this music, right? And can you come down and like make sure that it makes sense? <laughs> because I'm like scared that I'm not going to do a good enough job. But basically, I would just write all these pieces of music and he would come along afterwards. And because samples will let you do things that maybe wouldn't normally happen in an orchestra. So he would come in and be like, right, well, that violin line you've written would probably be more realistic and, and would sound nicer if we put it on a viol or I'm like, okay, cool. But he'll also do things like tell me what I've done that's interesting that I don't understand. <laughs> you know, like he'll be like, that chord is a whatever. And I'm like, cool, man. But he'll be like impressed. I'm like, I don't know what I've done. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I love that. I'm like, that's so cool. Like, tell me what it is. Tell me what I've done. Having that experience, then, have you tried to learn more about music reading and music theory or just say, <laughs> so just point where it's like, ah, I'm just going to keep going? I think I'm just going to keep going, you know. what? My, I think my primary thing once we get out of lockdown is to get actual piano lessons. Because everything I do, I do on a keyboard. If I can be like more proficient and learn a bunch of the theory of surrounding piano and music during that process and that will be very advantageous but um that's a lot just because i want to be faster i'm, I'm already fast but like I, if i'm armed with the knowledge and, and some more technical skill on the piano then i'll be faster or maybe i'll think more and that'd be a problem <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i try not to think too much i just try and do things you know i obviously have to think but like i don't want to think about what i'm going to do i just want to just do and see what comes out and hope for the best. I'm not thinking about how and technically and from a theory standpoint, if anything I'm going to do or what I'm thinking about is going to make sense. Like if it sounds good, I'm going to do it. And hopefully it's, if it sounds good, then it can't be wrong, right? Or even if it is wrong and it sounds good, then it still sounds good. I don't know, dude, do we need the rules? (laughs) That's one of the beautiful things about film music as a form is it's been around since, I don't know, like the 1920s. You know, with the film Camille Saint-Saëns did, like in I don't know, 1922 or something. Right. It's it's a hundred years old. There really aren't that many rules. Like a lot of the rules, like a lot of the rules exist from 19th century operas and and things that are only tangentially relevant. So at this point, it's almost not breaking rules because they don't they don't exist. People have preferences, but mm. there's nothing set in stone. Yeah, I just want to approach it all like I'm still in the rock band. You know, I just want to. I just want to write some tunes and not think about too much about how I'm going to do it or the process. Just just want to write some tunes, man. Rock out, hopefully, along the way at some point. 
that does explain the the ending track and hosts. Which... Well, that's not actually me. That's so the other oh, director, the, the other director and the the writer of the film, Adam Leader, is in a band called In Search of Sun. He's a singer. Um, so his band wrote the the song at the end. All right. So that that personally makes more sense to me because it does seem to be a palette jump between yeah. the score that had had come before and then that ending track. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, vastly different, vastly different. But I, I think it works really well though. I really like the I like the way it, it it sits within that final scene. Yeah. So have you have you then had a chance in other works you've scored or upcoming ones to directly implement your rock and metal background? Yes, I have. So we're in pre-production on a film called A Thousand Flames, and it's about a guy who's in a rock band who gets really badly injured and spends a lot of time recovering in a hospital where he meets a girl who dabbles on the acoustic and they form a relationship and start writing music together. So I was hired on that job to write all the songs in the film for the band and all the acoustic tracks, and then I'm also scoring the film. So that this is the first time I've really got to sort of write songs for a film as well as then scoring it, which will be really interesting. But it's been really fun because the band, I've had total freedom to just create this identity for a band. Ended up writing this sort of like, they're meant to be cocky. They're meant to not be like the nicest guys. They're like arrogant and think they're super cool and they're not famous or anything, but they just think they're like the shit, you know? So I wrote them this like Britishy sounding, swaggery rock and I had to write three songs, wrote all the music, wrote all the vocals, vocal lines, vocal melodies. I've got all the demos of me singing them. And I wrote, I'd never really written lyrics before, did all that. I had to write acoustic songs for a girl. I had to write the <laughs> lyrics and did like the vocal demos myself, like doing all falsetto stuff. And that's been wild, dude. It's been so much fun, though, like actually getting to like write some riffs. It's been good. But then... I'm hoping I get to do a bit more because I've got another film that's in pre-production and they want to go super industrial with it, like mm. Nine Inch Nails vibes. And again, another, a, new, a genre I've never worked in before. Should be super fun. I love that though, when they're like, whenever it's something I've never done before, that's so exciting because I just get to explore a whole new musical landscape. Like I know what Nine Inch Nails sounds like. I know I'm not going to listen to any of it. I'm just going to like, right, if I was going to set up my own industrial band, like what would it sound like? I'm just going to go wild and experiment. I love that. And I, I will say, I'm I'm a big metalhead, and I won't say I'm a huge industrial fan, but like, I... Me neither. I like... I mean, yeah, but I, I like industrial bands, and it's not that big in the genre. And I think both of those are... Maybe it's because of how relatively new the genres are, and how different they are from, like, your classic orchestral music that's normally used in film. Mm. But I think they're so vastly underutilized. So I'm really interested in seeing how those come out. And it's going to be really fun because we want the score to sound like industrial tracks, but I need to make it sound like film music at the same time. So I'm going to have to explore, like, how can I merge these things together? And, like, am I going to use traditional orchestral sounds or am I going to use synths but manipulate them into pads that sound sort of like they could be cinematic and then use them as, like, an orchestra of synths in some way? It's going to be wild. I can't wait. But part of it, too, is it's... Again, it, it's almost asking the question of, like, what does film music even sound like? I don't know if you've ever listened to David Lynch's score for Racerhead. I don't know, it's maybe 40 minutes of basically just industrial noise. It works brilliantly because the film has this industrial apocalypse feel to it. Right. But it is not film music at all in the traditional sense, and yet it works really well in the film. And, I mean, I have some otter tastes so i find it really enjoyable to listen to on its own as well that's the thing isn't it like i've heard about this before where it's where do you draw the line between what's music and what's not who decides is it preference does it have to have certain criteria to meet what qualifies as being music and i don't think it does you know but it also isn't for everyone right and that's the same with anything like if it for some it maybe even to me that might just sound like noise but to you it sounds like something else and that's what's interesting yeah, and I would love the question of what music is. This is, this is a, an embarrassing story for me, but this is maybe two years ago. I, 
I was listening to ambient music in my headphones and you know, I was I was doing something else. I was only like half paying attention to it, but I was really enjoying it. I was like, oh, I, you know, like I just have kind of a a random playlist on who is this band. I looked on my laptop and I didn't have music playing. It was just like the sounds of my water heater just making like ambient noises for the last 20 minutes. But you were hearing it passively through your headphones. Like you could hear it in the world, but you thought it was something playing. Yeah, it had enough sound for me to think like, oh, this is just experimental ambient music. And, you know, maybe, maybe that just like destroys my credibility as someone who talks about music. Well, I don't think it does because obviously it elicited an emotional response, right? Which, you know, could seem laughable, you know, depending on who you're asking. But <laughs> ultimately, I mean, I'm not a messiah. I don't, I don't know, but I would say what qualifies as being music is what elicits, if it elicits an emotional response one way or the other from somebody else, right? I don't know. That's up to you to decide. Well, I mean, I don't know. I think I at least like that definition because of how expansive it is. I also just can't stand the debates people have of broadly disliking genres or being like, oh, this wasn't made by physical instruments. It's made in a computer. Like, that's not music. The close-mindedness is so frustrating to me particularly now where there's just so much good music made in a zillion different ways and a zillion different styles. Yeah, and you, you can't you can't literally say that something's not music because it's been written in a computer. Like, I, I could play you some music that's been written on a computer and you wouldn't know. So how do you know anymore? Sampling has got so good that it does get to a point where it's going to be hard for anyone to know. So you're going to have to be pretty damn, have pretty damn good ears to know if you're being cheated out of listening to real music anymore it's funny though because it's a it's a conversation that i think has been going on for a really long time because i was watching a video with wendy carlos from 50 years ago and the narration was talking about how much flack she was getting for making synthesized versions of classical songs and it's like who cares, who cares? yeah life's too short to be debating what what is and what isn't music you yeah know? but you know what though I'm of the opinion, like, life's too short for most of the debates people have. Just enjoy what you enjoy. Let someone else enjoy what they enjoy. I agree. I agree. I did want to ask you, what what was the style of, of your metal band from way back when? Okay, well, the band was called Malefice. It's the only band I've ever been in. I started, I joined the band when I was, like, 17. And we were a bit of a mix of things, and it evolved over the years. Because we were together 10 years, so we have, like, three full-length albums and two EPs. It's all on, available on Spotify, Apple, you know, wherever you want to listen to your music. But it was basically heavy metal, like thrash, groove, some proggy stuff. Do you know what? I wrote all the songs, right? So I'd go so far as to say it's pretty similar to my approach to music now, right? Like I wrote metal and it was a bit of whatever I wanted. I didn't want to pigeon, there was no pigeonholing us into any particular one subgenre of metal. We dabbled in it all, really. And it's the same now. I write film music, but... You're not going to be able to limit me to writing in a particular style of film music. Hopefully, I'll always continue to push myself to write for films that are intentionally different to things I've already done. And the goal is for you to listen to it and recognize that it's me. And that's what's important. I like it. Just creating creating the identity that's you, not the specific tone or genre, but just... That sounds like Ben. You know, that sounds like a Benjamin Simon score. And that could be, hopefully, if you listen to Invasion Planet Earth or hosts, or whatever else I do, worlds apart musically, but hopefully there's something that just makes you know that it's me. You have to let me know if I ever get there. <laughs> <laughs> Life is a, an ever-evolving thing. You know, right now, the film industry is kaput, so I have to evolve. So I've been lucky in the sense that I actually managed to end up writing music for YouTubers at the moment. So I've written like 15 tracks over the last few months for a guy on YouTube called Internet Historian. Um, and I've been writing all sorts of stuff. He just did like an hour-long feature documentary style, even though it's it's all very funny. It's called The Gentleman Pirate, if you want to look it up, by Internet Historian. And it follows the, the life story of a pirate called Steed Bonnet, who, who came to be known as The Gentleman Pirate. I got to write some like ridiculous pirate music, some epic stuff. I also got to write uh, like an, an 80s synthwave-y kind of montage track, a la like Rocky, for when he goes on like Captain... That pirate captain training because he's a shit captain and it's just a mess like i've got to write so many different styles and i think that's like important that i might not 
end up being a film composer. Maybe I'll end up being someone who gets paid to write music for YouTube or kids TV or I don't know. Obviously, it would be nice if it was film, but ultimately, I want to write music for things and have a good time doing it. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Internet Historian, because I actually, I did listen to a few of those tracks earlier today. <laughs> and it was just funny, first going from hosts to that, because it's, it's like such an absurd genre change. I went from listening to bleak, dreadful music to this upbeat, fun, like silly 80s synth track. Yeah. This is not at all what I expected. But you know what, man? That's me in a nutshell. You know, like, I'm not a very serious dude. I'm kind of an idiot. I just want to have a good time and, and write music. And I, I absolutely loved writing that, that montage track. It was so much fun. But then, you know, I equally love holding one key down for 10 minutes and making some dread. And it's just as fun. Do you know? I just It's just a lot of fun getting to do what we do. And um, you should expect that we will go from dread to talking about getting scurvy on a dick in, in the next line. You know, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing. I love it. <laughs> uh, ben, I really appreciate you joining me today. Good luck with all your projects going, both in features, short films, YouTube, wherever else the path is going to take you. Thank you so much, dude. And let's um let's do a podcast in a year, and we'll see what's changed. I'd love it. Absolute pleasure, man.